tonight for the continuation of the Wilderness Issues Lecture Series. I apologize for what my voice might do in the next couple of minutes, but I'm getting over a, a nasty head cold. Um, tonight's speaker is Michael Fiebig with American River. And um, before I introduce him, I just want to remind you, next week's speaker is also coming to us from Bozeman, Montana. His name is Dan Vermillion, and he's with Sweetwater Travel Company. He's also commissioner, um, on <coughs> commissioner of Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And he's going to be talking about fish conservation in, uh, in Asia. So Mike is here tonight. Uh, he's a Weiss Fellow and Montana Campaign Coordinator at the Northern Rockies Office of American Rivers, which is uh, their office in Montana is located in Bozeman. As an organization, American Rivers has helped protect and restore over 150,000 miles of river. One thing that they're also notable for is that every year they publish um, a, a publication called America's Most Endangered Rivers that lists a series of river systems throughout the U.S. that are considered incredibly imperiled for various reasons, and we'll probably hear about some of those river systems this evening. Uh, Mike's background um, is that he's worked for American Rivers since 2011, and his work there focuses on protecting and restoring Montana's headwater rivers and streams by working with diverse groups of partners. Before coming to American Rivers, he worked as a presidential management fellow with the U.S. Forest Service, which is a, which is a program that I encourage many of you, um, if, you're, if you're graduate students, maybe get done with graduate school, it's a good fellowship opportunity to look into. Um, he was a presidential man management fellow, and then after that he worked on climate change response planning with the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee. And he also worked as a climate change specialist for the U.S. Agency for International Development in the Republic of Zambia. He earned an MS in Environmental Studies and Natural Resource Conflict Resolution from the University of Montana in 2008, so we have an alum with us tonight. And his work focused on place-based conservation legislation. But a lot of his passion for water comes not only from growing up in his home state of Michigan, <laughs> just a little shout out there, I'm also from Michigan, we just have an affinity for water. Um, but he was also a field instructor for many years for Knowles. And he's a longtime lover of rivers, having paddled over 11,000 miles of, of rivers in his paddling days. Tonight, Mike is going to be discussing the direct and indirect effects, or sorry, threats faced by rivers in the era of climate change. And he's going to be addressing issues both at home and abroad, while at the same time highlighting some potential ways to protect rivers as we move forward. Thank you, Mike, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, everyone. I'm, I'm, I have a loud voice, and I'm not used to speaking with... Uh, with a mic, so let me know if this is way too loud. Yeah. Could you please spell your last name? Sure, it's, uh, it's, it's right there. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's F-I-E-B-I-G. Yeah, it's a strange last name. So thank you all for coming out tonight. It's, it's always a pleasure to be back in Missoula. Um, as, a, as a lover of rivers, um, I just find Missoula to be a great river town and uh, had a great time at grad school here. My wife and I are really sad to leave. So. Um, I'm going to talk about a number of things tonight. Let me make sure that I'm, uh -oh, there we go. And uh, you know, biographical details aside, I think, I think the most important thing to know about me is that I'm, I'm a lover of rivers. I, uh, I'm very passionate about them. If you came here because you saw something in Headwaters News today, they actually said I was going to talk about uh, climate impacts on rivers. But I'll leave that to the distinguished Steve Running um, here. I, uh, I'm more from the advocacy side. I work in conservation. I'm not a climate scientist. But, um, you know, much of this love of mine developed from being a canoeist, a rafter, a kayaker, um, and having had a chance to interact with rivers on a really personal level. I think there are very few other ways to interact with a really powerful natural system than floating rivers or being in rivers. Um, so, that said, I'm um, going to talk tonight about some interconnected topics uh, that are important to us all. You know, fresh water, rivers, climate change. And I'll range around a little bit. I'll talk about some things at a broad global level, and then I'll get down to some stuff in Montana too. And then I'll jump back out to larger topics as well. 
So I'll get used to this too along the way. So if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll come over here. I, I brought some props tonight. And uh, for those in the front row, don't worry. You're like, what's he doing with this jug of water? Am I going to get wet? But you're not going to. But <laughs> I just wanted to illustrate how precious fresh water is to us. So this is a five-gallon jug, five-gallon jug of water. And if this is the total water on Earth, 97% of this is salt water. So if I pour this jug, I'm, I'm saving myself the pouring because then I would be the one getting wet. If I pour it into this little water bottle to this line, this is 19 ounces. This is the 3% of fresh water that we have on Earth. If I take that and take away 2% that's locked up in rock and ice, or I mean, sorry, glaciers and ice, and pour it into this little tiny six ounce cup, so basically six shot glasses out of five gallons, um, th this, is, this is the water that we have available to us globally in rivers, lakes, streams, soil, all of it. This is, this is all of our fresh water out of, out of all the water on Earth. So we are a water planet. We're, we're mostly water, but there's very little, there's very little for us to, uh, to all split. And we split it in a lot of interesting ways. And I'm going to bring my, my water demo over here to, to drink off of. Um, Uh-oh. I think I hit the button that the, the tech said not to hit. Josh, are you still here? No? There we go. Great. It's, it's always bad when, when the tech sets you up and there's a little button and he says, don't touch this one. <laughs> I'm bound to touch it. Um, so, so I'm going to run through some. These, these are some cartograms. And uh, they're from worldmapper.org. I, I suggest you take a look at it. And this is, this is the, the world, the global projection we're used to, um, divided up by country and normal geographic size. If we look at the country's size proportionately to their greenhouse gas emissions, you notice that the global north gets, gets very, uh, very large, um, disproportionately so to the global south. Um, you look at Africa, Africa basically disappears. Forest loss, we have that reversed. And you know, we know that much of our fresh water comes from rain falling in forests. And, uh, here we have uh, the uh, global south experiencing the most forest loss. So what that tells me is a lot of the resources from the global south are, are being transported to the global north. Water use, you can see that, uh, again, the global north is much larger users of water, especially Asia, India. <laughs> Groundwater recharge, unfortunately, seems to be mostly in the global south. So we've got the major users in the north, major uh, recharge happening in the south. And then, of course, what comes from that is water depletion. And we see uh, the global north being quite large as far as depleting their aquifers, either polluting or, or mining their, their water resources. And uh, basically, climate change, as you all know, climate change is, is hydrologic change. Um, that's where it hits us, you know, in the gut. Um, those are the biggest, most unpredictable changes that we're facing. And I'll talk some more about those later, but this should be pretty familiar to, to you all. Um, climate change also affects our energy systems, our agriculture systems, um, as well as our environment, as well as our ecology. So it's going to have huge impacts on both human and natural systems. Um, energy, agriculture, ecosystem services, so forth. The Montana picture is Rock Creek over in the uh, Absorca Beartooths. So I'm going to divide the talk up today and do a couple things. I'm, I'm going to start with direct effects of climate change on rivers. Then I'll go into indirect effects. And then I'll talk about some of the processes out there and some development that is magnifying effects of climate change. So 
to start, um, and this, this is some data that does come from Steve Running. I was fortunate enough to hear from him this past fall and uh, some work he did on, on uh, climate change effects on rivers in Montana. So CO2 emissions from anthropogenic sources increased 5.9% in 2010. Um, that was a huge jump after a drop in 2009. You know, they went down by 1.4% in 2009. But we're at uh, 389 parts per million now, and uh, that's the biggest annual jump ever recorded. Um, what we can predict from that, what, the, what does that mean here in the Northern Rockies, uh, according to Dr. Running and some of his colleagues, um, and we can expect to see an average two degree Celsius temperature rise in our lifetime um, with perhaps up to an eight and a half degree Celsius temperature rise by 2100. That's just massive. Um, right now, the, and this is going off previous IPCC um, emission scenarios, their fifth assessment is underway and uh, all of the we, we've basically been tracking at greenhouse gas emissions that are larger than the largest worst case scenario they, uh, they looked at in the previous assessment. So it'll be interesting when the, the next one comes out. Excuse me. So what does this mean for Montana's rivers? Um, what it means is a declining water balance, a shift in seasons, and a decline in April 1st snowpack. Uh, by 2050, global climate models project Montana to be five degrees warmer in the summer, um, causing a lot more evaporation, but receive 10% rainfall overall. Where, that, where we'll probably see this really cause problems is in low flow river scenarios. So August, September, when our streams already run at base flow, uh, they'll be warmer, they'll be lower, they'll be more dry. So this is jumping around. This is the Escalante water, watershed. And you know, changing hydrologic patterns, you know, droughts, floods, rain on snow events, um, these are all projected in climate change. But I think it's most important to, to think that it's not just the total amount of water that falls uh, in a given area over the course of a year, which a lot of statistics out there are based on but it's how it's divided. So if, if you're going for a 30-day hike in the desert and you need a gallon a day on average for your 30 days, that's really different than if you jump in a 30-gallon tank on your first day and then have to make a dry walk for 29 more days. So we're seeing that with climate change too. So rainfall, um, states that may get the same amount of rainfall in an average year We'll get it at different times and in different amounts. Um, when we see extreme rainfall events um, with flooding, large uh, events of runoff, that is very different than if we see a, a slowly accumulating snowpack or a slow soaking rain. Anyone that's tried to water their garden with the hose on full blast knows this really well versus a drip system. Sorry, the whole, the whole mic thing. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm going to get into some of the indirect effects. Um, this is a cutthroat trout, uh, Snake River fine spotted cutthroat. And uh, what, it, you know, an endangered species or threatened species. And I think the best way to think of climate change and its indirect effects is that climate change is a stressor and a threat magnifier. So a lot of the threats that our species are already facing, a lot of the challenges environmentally we already deal with as a species will get worse and harder to deal with under climate scenarios, especially in the case of water. So for fish, you know, we can see decreasing habitat and connectivity for fish and wildlife, both from climate change itself and indirect threats like invasive species and water developments and other developments in river corridors. Um, there's a great study last year uh, by Seth Wenger and some other folks um, that predicted a, a cutthroat population decrease by 33% by 2080 um, and a 58% decline in trout habitat by 2080 as well. So the other indirect effect and, and something that American Rivers works on a lot is that you know with decreased water and water stressed 
human environments, we can see a call for more dams and water diversions. Um, we can also see a call for more dams and diversions under climate change as a carbon-free um, energy alternative for hydropower. So what do dams cause? They cause habitat fragmentation, uh, habitat change. So you know, it changes the water temperature, the silt content, and the hydrograph. You know, I mean, we have a, we have a hydrograph here in, in the Rocky Mountains that has a great big spring peak and then a really low base flow at the end of the summer. And our fish species and our other species that depend on rivers have evolved to that hydrograph and that the silty, dirty, raging, cold waters every spring. Um, we also see invasive species. So when you get a big reservoir like this that gets warm, uh, loses its current, um, that's, that's great habitat for other species that don't normally live in trout habitats. Um, see evaporative losses. This isn't Glen Canyon Dam, obviously, but the reservoir Powell behind Glen Canyon Dam loses the total annual runoff of the Yampa River to evaporation every single year. And the Yampa is the, la the largest free-flowing tributary of the Colorado. So total annual, uh, annual uh, uh, volume of water from the Yampa evaporates every year from Reservoir Powell. I also get stuff like human property displacement and sometimes a carbon source actually from vegetation rotting underneath the reservoir. So you're actually releasing some methane and some other potent greenhouse gases, further magnifying climate change. So what else are we going to see? We're going to see, uh, um, I just missed something. OK, there we go. A decreasing recreation opportunities due to low, low warm stream flows. The whitewater excitement might look as exciting as that boat does on that trailer in the future under climate change, especially in August. Um, and unfortunately, climate change, and, and especially with water resources, is projected to disproportionately affect the poor. So Latinos, African Americans, the elderly will also um, be more prone to heat waves, flooding, storms, um, increasing water prices, increasing commodities prices, et cetera. Um, great study just came out this year from the California Department of Public Health um, that looked at this. And also, unfortunately, on the human topic, um, at the same time, a recent Pew poll stated that 63% of Americans, only 63%, say there's solid evidence of global warming, and uh, only 38% believe that it's human caused, um, as well as only 38% believe that it's a serious problem. Uh, those that do tend to be more educated, more liberal, younger, and women more than men. So go get them. So as I said earlier, there are a lot of threats be that are magnifying climate impacts, um, both in feedback loops that are causing more climate impacts, as well as making water stressed and heat stressed areas more stressed yet. Um, this, of course, is a map of, uh, of oil shale plays. You can see, if I can switch my, you can see us up here, the Bakken in North Dakota that folks have heard a lot from. Um, I wish I had the slide for it, but uh, you can actually see the Bakken from space right now because of all of the, the gas that's being flared off. Um, the gas isn't being collected in the Bakken because gas prices are so low, only the oil is. So the Bakken's lit up to the same extent that Chicago, Boston, so far out there, and it's because of natural gas flares. In Montana, the play that folks are talking about is the Heath Formation. Um, well, we'll, we'll see where that goes, but uh, that's something for us to watch for sure, as well as the Bakken on the eastern side of Montana. And, and as you can see too, I mean, there's not only the, not only the climate impacts, but um, these types of installations take incredible amounts of water. And uh, rightfully, be, because of the Clean Water Act, they, they have to use fresh water to do this. Um, and, but it, it, it uses a ton, and uh, it's, 
the, the fracking techniques that are used these days, I think, I think it's an unanswered question um, how they'll be affecting our, our water resources in the future. When, when you've got faucets that are flaming like this when you turn them on, um, we're, we're dealing with an unknown experiment as far as our fresh water. And that little 1%, that little six ounces out of five gallons, that's all we've got. So if we're polluting that, maybe that turns into three ounces rather than six. So I'm going to jump around a little more. This is something that uh, I was brought aware of just a couple weeks ago, actually. I saw a man that you, you all might have heard of. His name is Mike Fay, speak in uh, Bozeman. He's a National Geographic explorer, and he lives up in this area on the uh, southeastern, uh, southeastern Alaska. Um, this is actually in northwest British Columbia. And folks here, because of the megalode transport and stuff, I'm assuming that uh, you all know a lot about the, uh, the tar sands in Alberta and the industrial impacts there. So I'm not going to talk about that tonight. But I'm going to talk about something that, that folks might not have, have heard of yet. Um, I heard Mike Fay talk about it. It kind of blew me away. And I need to spread the word, too. So this is one of the things that can be a magnifier of, of, uh, of climate change. So this is, this is up in the headwaters of the Skeena. And uh, it's, uh, or actually, this is, this is farther up. Uh, I think this is in the, uh, the Unuk. And uh, so really remote area in northwest British Columbia. Um, people call it the Golden Triangle, though. Really gorgeous area, too. I wish I should have actually dimmed some of these lights up here. Um, so really beautiful, really, uh, really diverse, um, and really remote. And it's, and it's the habitat of some of the last best remaining salmon streams in the world. So all five uh, species of Pacific salmon are still in this area in, uh, in healthy numbers. Just gorgeous up there. Now let's talk a little about what's planned for it. This, this area is called, people refer to it as the Golden Triangle. So from Golden British Columbia, basically up to the Alaska state line, is the last, it's kind of the mother load of copper and gold in the world. It's the largest untapped deposit on Earth. And the government of British Columbia is planning to tap it. So. If we look at the next picture, so this is, this is uh, let me see when this was. This is current development levels, and you can't see it really well, but there's not a whole lot there. And this is proposed. So this big, this is a, this is a 5,000 well coal bed methane um, proposal that's at the sacred headwaters of the Stikine River, the Nass River, and the... Uh, it's the Stikine, the Nass, and the Skeena. <laughs> um, so this, this headwater is, feeds all three of these pristine rivers. And uh, um, 6,000 coal bed methane wells are planned there by Royal Dutch Shell. You can also see the rest of these developments. This is all leased mining territory. There are seven large copper and gold mines planned for this area. They're, uh, on the scale, there's one of them, the KSM, that is, uh, is already planned to be larger than the largest mine that exists on Earth. So, and all seven are right up there. Too many remotes. So this is a close-up. Again, this is today. This is current. Um, you can see there are some, there is some, some development, a little bit of exploratory stuff, and then this is the future. So those are all leases. And uh, basically, this is remote country. You know, the, the sacred headwaters and the headwaters of the Unuk and the Iskut. Um, the, uh, it'll affect other rivers, too, that some of you might have heard of. The Tachinchini Alsac, the Chilkat, the Taku, the Whiting, the, uh, and, and then, of course, the, the Stikine, the Skeena, and the Nas. This is, uh, this is a map on Google Earth of the mines. So you can see both, uh, both existing 
and uh, proposed. They kind of pepper all of Northwest British Columbia. As, and the British Columbian government is planning to electrify this region too. So it'll help uh, bring development into the area. Right now it's, it's uh, totally undeveloped, but they're gonna run high tension wires there, partly uh, fueled by coal-fired power plants, partly fueled by hydropower. And these are all the, they're hard to see, but these are all the hydropower dams. So the Forest Kerr project as well, the one highlighted right here, just that one calls for a 195 megawatt run of the river dam that would divert the Iscut River, which is prime salmon habitat, through a 30 foot diameter tunnel for two miles to generate power for um, one of the mines. So th this, is, this is again, I mean, combined with the tar sands in Alberta, this is, this is uh, going to be industrial development that's on a scale that we just haven't really seen on Earth in a single area yet. And unfortunately, it's also in a place that's remote, roadless. It's one of the last wild strongholds of native fish, of grizzlies, of wolves, of lynx. It's a, it's a special, incredibly endangered area. And I encourage you all to, to look this up and, uh, and add your voices. Um, it's, it's hard. I mean, we, we have 7 billion people on Earth already and nearly 4 billion um, that are working up to the resource consumption that we have in this country today. And, uh, you know, those minerals are going to come from somewhere. And right now, um, they're being proposed to come into one of the last, or come from one of the last wild strongholds in North America. This has been in the news a lot lately. Um, I'm not going to dwell on, on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge or the Keystone XL pipeline, but um, they're important to mention. Uh, again, you know, we're, as, a, as, a, as a species, humans are going to get their energy and their development from somewhere, but I think we have to decide um, where we should be getting that and what areas need to be kept as special and sacred. Okay, moving a little bit on that happy note. Um, we'll move from, uh, from some of the issues we're facing, some of the threats, to uh, some of the potential solutions and some of the things that are being done. So this is a map of the wild and scenic rivers in the United States. Um, and it didn't sh doesn't show up super well, but um, it's also a map of some of our public land estate. It's colored in there too. And one thing that I think you can see from the current public lands estate, our, our preserved areas, and our wild and scenic river maps, is that, uh, that they're kind of fragmented overall too. Um, we're lucky enough in Montana to have some huge blocks that are connected. You know, the Bob Marshall, um, the, uh, the greater Yellowstone area, all through the Bitterroots, but a lot of our country does not. And uh, under climate change, one of the things we're looking at is that those areas with island biogeography, um, they need to be larger and larger to support that, those populations of species that we want to hang on to. So this is a, this is a, uh, a map of the watershed t condition classifications that the Forest Service put out just this past year. And uh, green, they're, they're hard to see too. Green are healthy, um, yellow are, are uh, I believe there they are, functioning at risk, and, uh, and red are impaired function. And uh, you can see a lot of yellow and, and some red up in there too. Um, you can also see with the Forest Service estate that there, there are big chunks that are, if you, if you were to remove all the yellow and all the red under a climate scenario or a stress scenario in the future, you'd have a lot of little islands, um, which is hard long term for species, both for genetic diversity connectivity. This is a little closer to home, region one. Same thing. Um, imagine removing the yellow and red and, uh, and having some of the green turn to yellow or red in the future. And uh, I think it's pretty obvious that our current uh, protected estate isn't, isn't sufficient to keep our species of, uh, of fish going in perpetuity. So, and here we've got some native trout. This is down at an even lower level. 
native trout strongholds in western Montana. And again, um, you can see that they're, they're not all fully connected. Um, makes it hard. The, the, little, the little remaining um, fingerlings here and there, uh, the little hunks that are off by themselves, um, may not fare so well in the future. So another thing, as I mentioned before, we're seeing a lot of plans for new dams. Um, now I'm going to tell you about some of those that are, that are proposed as well. This is, a, this is an old one, obviously. This is Glen Canyon Dam. Um, so this is the Susitna, the headwaters of the Susitna in Alaska. Um, the Susitna has an 800 foot high dam plan there. It'll cost five to eight billion dollars, create 300 megawatts. It's a beautiful, pristine headwaters area and critical salmon habitat in Alaska. This is all pictures of the Susitna. The Bataka Gorge Dam on the Zambezi, another um, iconic river worldwide in Zimbabwe is back on the uh, back on back in plans again. Patagonia, the Rio Bakker dam site. This is where the dam will be built on the the Bakker, and uh, that'll flood 11,000 acres, 1,100 miles of transmission lines for hydropower to Santiago as well. Um, and this is just stellar area. This is the the confluence of the Bakker and the Neff. This will be flooded in Patagonia. There are five dams, I should say, five dams total planned on the Bakker and the Pasqua down there too. Um, worth mentioning too, Brazil is planning 48 new hydroelectric power dams by 2020, um, 18 of which will be on the Amazon River. This is a change, of course, from the Brazilian government from what they had said before. And then this is the Sundarbans in Bangladesh. It's the kind of exquisite mangrove delta that's at the confluence of the Brahmaputra, the Mena, and the Ganges. This is threatened by, by numerous dams upriver as well. But there, there, there's an answer there. Um, some of you may recognize this. This was in a Patagonia catalog a while ago. Um, but not only uh, preventing dams from being built in areas, again, that are prioritized where they shouldn't be built, putting those instead in areas where maybe they'd be more uh, suitable. But we can also take down existing dams that are either really harmful or have fulfilled their, their useful life. Here's an example that's been in the news lately from American Rivers and American Whitewater and others. Um, Elwad River water, watershed on the Olympic Peninsula had two dams. See, now we're getting into what's possible, something a little more upbeat than, than the gloom and doom. <laughs> two dams here, one the Glines, um, one the Elwa, blocking off 75 miles of pristine salmon habitat. Um, you, up until uh, you know, last year, 4,000 salmon would spawn in uh, this little area right here. Um, once this is removed, fully removed, um, they expect close to half a million salmon to be spawning up in those headwaters. Real success story. This is the previous, uh, this is Glines Canyon Dam in 2009. This is Glines Canyon Dam last week. So this is awesome. It's great. It's happening right now. And these are the salmon that are going to come back very soon. <laughs> the other thing we're dealing with, uh, we're dealing with development. In Montana we see that, we don't see that a lot maybe, but um, this is on the Yellowstone River. That is a picture of a house on the Yellowstone River. But we see folks building along river corridors. And uh, the, you can see basically, this is, this is 1900, this is the lower Yellowstone in Montana. And if you click through the year, each of those dots is, uh, is a development as a home. So basically, if we were to take away the river, you would still be able to see where it was. So, and, and, and no wonder, rivers are, rivers are critical places for, for uh, humans and, and animals alike, but Unfortunately, when humans build close to the river, they interrupt some of the other functions of river corridors. Um, 
related to that, we, see, we saw a lot of floods last year in 2011. This isn't from Montana. This is a photo of, of the Connecticut River from space, the plume shooting out into the ocean from flooding they had over there. But this is a shot from Montana. This is the Musselshell River. And a lot of folks had, uh, had a lot of hardship last year out in eastern Montana because of floods. This is a shot from Kansas, uh, Kansas City. This is a levee. So unfortunately, there, there are a couple things to do with, with floods. Um, but one of the things we see after big flood events is that folks call for more water structure, um, levees and so forth. But there are other alternatives. Um, we don't have to build levees. We don't have to channelize a river and make flood events larger and more catastrophic in the future. And all these levees cost a lot of money to build and maintain as well. Um, if you actually let the river expand into its original flood plain, um, it, it'll min mitigate the flood. And in, the, in an era of climate change, it'll also provide ongoing um, fresh water and water residents too. So these are, these are some great photos. Um, this is the Mussel Shell. 2009, you can see where the arrow is. Um, same stretch of river, same view in 2011. You can see the, the river totally cut that bend. Um, again, Mussel Shell, 2009, 2011, cut through the bend. And this is what rivers are supposed to do. They're really dynamic beasts, uh, especially out here. You know, we, we rely on our, our Fish species rely on this sediment transport. Animals rely on um, these rivers moving around like this. So there's some things we can do. A tool that has a lot of potential is uh, channel, channel migration zone mapping. So here we've got 1951. Um, you can, from, uh, from numerous studies, you can estimate that uh, the river in that bend is going to move, so you look in the middle, 1,267 feet over 50 years. And then you will click through, and it does. So we can, we can map these out and show deposition areas and ablation areas. And uh, these would be very useful for, not only for preservation, so you'd want to preserve that river corridor and those wetlands around it, but also for, for human property. I don't know about you, but if I was on this piece of land and I had this piece of scientific data, um, I probably wouldn't build my house right here any longer. I might want to build either here or over here. Um, so these are, this is a critical tool that we can use and that is being used. Oh, there we go. This is, a, this is a portion of the Yellowstone that's been mapped. Um, very few places have been mapped, though. Um, this is in its beginning stages, but has a lot of conservation value, especially in, in a, a climate-constricted world. Got an, an, old, uh, an old enemy uh, pollution, um, oil spills, urban runoff, uh, trash, and so forth. There's a lot of things we can do for this, too. Um, rooftop gardens. So one of the things American Rivers really works on is greening uh, urban infrastructure. So absorbing extra water from high precipitation events that we'll see more of from climate change. Naturally, uh, naturally filtering it through plants. And also, this has the added benefit of, in a hotted world, hotter world, this cools your building. It also provides habitat for living creatures on the top of it, whether that's pollinators, or that's bird species, what may have you. You can also do things uh, like I know a lot of you probably do here, both on the Bitterroot and the Blackfoot. Um, join a river cleanup, um, get involved at a local level um, to make your, your rivers a better place. It's amazing uh, the friends you'll meet doing things at a national river cleanup. Um, and uh, it's also really cool when you've got a giant pile like that of stuff at the end of your day to haul out. So we, we also have, we'll also have to deal with more demand in the future. There will be more folks. Um, we're, we're depleting a lot of our existing water resources. So the water resources that we'll have yet left will have more of a demand on them than we'll, we've seen so far. So what do we do for more demand? 
Um, rather, than, rather than water infrastructure, um, harmful dams or diversions, um, we can do something like this. This is a part of the Sierra Meadows project in California. It's a green water storage project. So essentially restoring wetlands, restoring, uh, restoring this meadow, this wet meadow, allows a larger quantity of water to naturally be stored in this, this environment. It's an ecosystem services type project. So it's good for, it's good for the land and the municipal water supplies downriver um, will stay full more times of the year from a restored meadow. Um, also, the, the benefit of this, you know, this particular one, this is at high altitude. Um, it's also shaded by plants and infiltrated in the soil. So you don't have the evaporative loss that you'd have on something like a reservoir. That was in California. This is in Montana. This is a, a wetland up in Trail Creek off the North Fork of the Flathead, one of our wild and scenic rivers. And uh, things like this are just, uh, just gems. You know, when, when uh, my colleague and I came across this, this wetland meadow up there, we're like, wow, this is just incredible. So something like this, um, this one's functioning, it's intact. So it's not only restoring ones that have been degraded, but it's protecting ones like this. And, uh, and you know, it's not only a matter of the, the immediate habitat here, but for all the downstream users, um, human and animal alike. And in Montana, you know, our, our wetlands are small um, comparatively you know, to some, uh, some, like my home state of Michigan. Wetlands everywhere, though they're depleting them fast. Um, a lot of our wetlands look like this. This is below Immigrant Peak. Um, it's a small wetland. Before that area, you could have over 75% of your species in the general vicinity rely on that little wetland. Very critical to protect and restore. So I'm going to start wrapping up. And, uh, and ultimately, this is, this is a wild and scenic uh, river stretch too. This is part of the Snake Headwaters. Um, iconic view outside of Jackson, Wyoming. And an interesting thing about the snake is that uh, the, the headwaters are protected as a system, um, which is different than we've protected a lot of other headwaters or a lot of other rivers and streams. We haven't protected them as a system. This is close to home as well. This is the, the middle fork of the Salmon River. Some of you might have floated it, um, hopefully. If not, you should. Um, but again, uh, one of the, uh, the longest undammed um, rivers in the area um, and, and just a gem. So I think I'll close. Um, and this is, this is the headwaters of the Skeena, part of the sacred headwaters that's threatened by the 6,000 coal bed methane wells. But I, I, I think I'll close with, um, since we have a lot of students in the audience and, uh, and since Young people, um, especially according to this study that I, I quoted earlier, are really the folks that we're looking to, uh, to help make some of these solutions happen. I, I think the challenge is for us and for you is to start thinking out of the box and thinking like a system. Um, the smaller solutions, the, uh, the easier solutions conservation-wise um, under climate are uh, the conservation challenges we've had already. And they weren't easy, but the, the easier solutions have been done. The ones that are left are, are large, they're complex. Climate change is so complex that a lot of Americans don't even understand it. So, um, and unfortunately, our political system doesn't deal with complex long-term things very well. It deals with short-term things, with really simple solutions. But I think the challenge to you all is to get the word out there that that complex solutions are okay. And long-term complex solutions are what we need. Um, and we need to start thinking bigger and thinking together and working together to get the resources to protect our rivers, um, protect our watersheds, and, uh, and really lay out a vision um, both for humans and our natural environment in the future. Um, with that, I think, I think I'll... Uh, I'll wrap it up and move to questions. Um, there's me if you want to contact me later. Okay.
Any questions? Yes. Well, that's a good question. So the question was uh, the the Elwha River Dam uh, removal projects were in the works for for decades, and what was the turning point? Um, I honestly don't know. I wasn't. I my organization was involved with those, but I wasn't personally. I'm a I'm a fairly new American Rivers person, but I don't know what the turning point was. But I know that a lot of folks worked persistently over a really long time, building coalitions, um, getting resources, uh, a lot of organizations joining together, and I think it was a, a matter of lining a lot of things up. And and again, it, it was a complex long term excuse me, long-term solution. And uh, I don't know this for sure, but I wouldn't say there's, there was probably one, one turning point at all. Um, I bet it was a lot, of, a lot of work by a lot of people over a long time. Yeah? Is there any pressure from, like you're saying Brazil has got a lot of, a lot of damage planned, um, especially on the Amazon, uh, in a relatively short time period. Is there any pressure from, um, like it's, it's only from, from Brazil itself and the international community or other governments or anything like that to kind of hold back on that or like not do it? Yeah, so the question was uh, it, with uh, Brazil's massive hydropower plan for the Amazon, is there, is there pushback either internally or, or internationally um, for Brazil not to do that? And, and the answer is definitely yes. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure how strong that pushback is um, relative to what they're facing. Um, but yeah, there definitely is. I mean, there there are local organizations organized against it, um, and of course, the international community um, has definitely has their eyes on the Amazon rainforest. I mean, it's it's our uh, it's our largest carbon sequester sequestration. Um, device that holds uh, a, a super hard, large portion of the biodiversity on Earth. And uh, you know, the Amazon, were it to dry up um, through development or, or otherwise, um, there's a good chance that would change the weather of the world, too. I mean, that's, we're looking at hydrologic change on a, on a planetary scale just by losing a large portion of the Amazon. So folks are definitely for, focused on it, but there are very large, powerful interests in, in Brazil that want to make that happen. Um, and it's a sovereign nation, so we can just keep fighting the good fight, and hopefully, reason wins the day. Yeah. The uh, Patagonian situation. The last I heard, the they were not going to dam the Funafu, and there was a lot of sense that they weren't going to do the Bakker. You're talking like that's going to happen next week. <laughs> well, I'm I'm not sure if it's going to happen or not. That the, the, there's a, there's a lot of opposition to those dams down there. Um, but unfortunately, again, there are some very powerful interests um, that, uh, that are planning those developments. Um, the, uh, you know, the laws are different down there than they are here, but in the, in the terms that we know, the, they've already been leased. So, um, you know, they're, they're, and, and unfortunately, the, uh, the money behind those developments isn't coming from the area that is is going to be dammed, which is which is pretty tough. It's something that we deal with um, with some of our development here in the Northern Rockies. You know, I mean, just a, a lot like the Northern Rockies, uh, Patagonia and the Southern Cone is somewhat of an energy colony. Um, and from the folks in Santiago, in a in a country, Chile, that has uh, is predicted to have a huge deficit in electricity in the future. They get a lot of their electricity from their neighbor. Um, Argentina, which they're not super fond of, and uh, they look at this as energy independence, and they look at it as low carbon, and and there are some really powerful multinational interests that want to make some money off of building that as well. Um, the, there are some great economic uh, studies that have looked at at the dams down there, though, showing how how 
uh, costly they'd be, how they wouldn't ever pay for themselves, how the 1,100 mile transmission line doesn't really make sense with losses and the, the uh, you know, the biodiversity down there and, and the water resources being destroyed um, would have much more of a detrimental economic impact. Um, but again, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. I think your question's a good one and I think it's an open question still. Um, but uh, I, I think I, we can't let our guard down, that's for sure. Yeah, Dan. By case basis, when they remove a dam, to do what they do with the sediment? So, so Dan asked on a, on a case, did you, you ask on a case by case basis what, what happens with the sediment? Dam, what do you do with all the sediment that's contaminated or either, if it's not contaminated, what do you do with all the sediment anyways? Well, well, it's interesting. Um, I think it depends on, on what's in the sediment. I think you just mentioned, well, if the sediment's contaminated, you know, you all are, are really familiar with the Milltown dam removal. Um, that sediment got, got moved away. Um, up river a little farther and uh, and uh, on, on some of the dams that have been removed in in Washington um, recently uh, the sediments being allowed to uh, erode and go back out to sea it just it just really depends on on both the infrastructure around the uh, the headwaters area so for instance in somewhere like the Elwha um, you know I'm not sure what's happening with the sediment um, and somewhere like the, uh, the white salmon, the, the dam that was just removed, the sediment's naturally eroding out to the Columbia. So I think it's a case by case type basis. Yes? Can you talk a little bit more about your organization? <coughs> yeah, so the, uh, the question was, or, or the request was, uh, talk a little bit about your organization, its mission, uh, what you guys do, um, some of the projects you're involved in. So, American Rivers is the largest national river conservation organization. Um, but we, we live somewhere, in, and we're a national organization based in D.C., but we live somewhere in between the, the smaller local uh, grassroots nonprofits and the really large national nonprofits. We're somewhat in the middle. We have uh, uh, headquarters in D.C., and we have bases kind of all over, or offices all over the country. So. California, Northern Rockies, Colorado, um, Midwest, Southeast, um, Northwest, so forth. And depending on that area, um, the, the folks in those offices can work in different program areas that, that American Rivers delves into. So American Rivers works on uh, urban and, and clean water issues. Um, we work on river protection, so wild and scenic rivers, uh, uh, protection of rivers through uh, through uh, private lands, um, conservation uh, incentives, so forth. Um, there's a large part of American Rivers, obviously, that works on river restoration and dam removal as well, um, and that varies by office too. Um, and then uh, we have uh, a whole group of folks that work on flood mitigation, um, floodplain restoration, floodplain protection. Um, flood management, so, um, and uh, then we have folks that work on climate change stuff too. So it, it really depends on, on the area you work in. In the Northern Rockies, um, we're, we're fortunate enough up here that we can work a lot in river protection. Um, we tend to have really intact um, a wealth of wonderful rivers up here. Uh, the folks that work in the Southeast, um, May, may work a lot more on, on restoration or, or clean water and stuff like that. So I hope that answered your question. All right. Yes. How are you able to stay as optimistic as you are in the face of the seven billion people? Well, I, I, well, it's a personal choice. Um, but, but I think, uh, you know, no, nothing big got accomplished by being pessimistic. And uh, you know, the optimism that you bring to something, the energy that you, you can bring to something, I think uh, um, you know, if that can, if that can, can uh, translate into any energy that in, to folks in the crowd, um, I've, I've done way more than I hoped for this talk tonight. So I, and I actually do think there's hope. You know, humans, for every, every rough thing that we see in the news, and our media is full of it, 
um, you see a bunch of beautiful things that humans can accomplish. We see them every day. And you know, there's no reason we can't accomplish more beautiful things in conservation and conservation of rivers too. You know, it's not overwhelming. The, uh, you know, the, the politics tell us and the, and, and the media tells us that these problems are insurmountable, but they're not. We got ourselves into it, we can get ourselves out of it. Thanks, and yeah. What flood mitigation measures can you take other than, than damming? Well, I think, I think a great, that's a good question. So what flood mitigation measures can you take other than damming? Um, I think a really cool one is if we look overseas again, the Netherlands, who those folks are, are you know, no pun intended, neck deep in water management, um, and they have been for a long time, ever since the little boy put the thumb in the dike. And uh, they, they have this, and they have levees and dams and diversions and so forth. I mean, most of their country is under, you know, below sea level. And something that the Dutch started doing recently was they had this new national program that they call Room for the Rivers, making room for rivers. So they're actually taking money that, uh, you know, they'd have to do to rebuild levees and flood prone area, prone, flood prone areas, hard to say, um, dams and so forth, buying up that land or buying easements on that land and restoring the river to its natural floodplain, its wetlands, its, uh, you know, its, its ability to travel across its floodplain. It's, uh, if you think of it this way, you know, if I'm, if I'm dumping water down a really little straight ditch and I add a lot more water to it, the only place for that water to go is up and over the ditch. If I have a really shallow, wide, meandering stream and I'm dumping water in, if I dump more into that area, it's going to hit those meanders. It's going to do what we saw in the channel migration zone maps. It's going to cut across its floodplain. And that larger river corridor can hold that water without shooting it all downstream. Um, and, and speaking of which, I think we have an opportunity on the Mississippi right now to do just that. You know, in these great floods that we saw last year, the Army Corps of Engineer had to, Army Corps of Engineers had to blow a number of the levees. So these levees constrain the Mississippi um, to where they're about, when the floodwaters are about ready to top them um, or they're about ready to flood a town upstream, the Corps can blow up the levees and allow the river to go back into its normal floodplain. And it's, a, it's an emergency management type scenario. But you know, they had to blow up a lot of these levees to save some towns upstream. And uh, the plan right now is to rebuild the levees bigger, taller, larger for multiple billions of dollars. When what would be easier or, and better ecologically, a long-term solution, cheaper, would be to restore that river to its floodplain, either through easements or through, uh, through outright purchasing of that land. I think that's the, the biggest thing that we can do, and, and that's, that's utilizing the, the natural flood mitigation that nature has given us for, for millennia, which is uh, wetlands, um, the, uh, the, everything below the high water mark, um, and bringing those back to the way they were before. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, right here, Lily. So, as the optimist, with three accomplishments for the next five years. If you can, reverse decision. Three accomplishments for the next five years. Yeah, that, in an ideal world. Um, I, I'd really like to see more strategies out there um, in a place-based fashion, either watersheds, regions, so forth, that really looked at preservation of rivers holistically. So something that, that combined, say, protection of rivers on public lands with restoration in degraded areas and uh, incentive for private landowners to uh, protect rivers through private lands. I'd, I'd really like to see that. Um, I think it'd be a way for us to deal with climate change. I think it'll be a way for us to secure our water resources and these habitats into the future. And I think it makes sense from a lot of perspectives. Um, that's one. That's a big one. I, I'd like to see us adopt um, more of a room for rivers type mentality in this country too. I, I'd, I'd like to see folks talk more about the way rivers work 
and rather just like we've kind of turned the corner in some senses as far as wildland fires, I'd like us to turn the corner in some senses as far as wild rivers too. Um, flooding rivers, rivers that are, are in peak runoff in the spring, um, shouldn't be something to be afraid of or, or, or to tame. They should be something that we, we can live with. And third, um, I don't know, those are, those, I think those two are big enough. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> any any other questions? Yes. I had a question about uh, again going back to dams in uh, South America. We use the term uh, prioritize. Yeah. And these are prioritized rivers that uh, we propose to have dam. And that's one solution to move these again this year where to move to better areas. Mm -hmm. I was wondering first of all, you tell me who's making these assessments and under what criteria, especially given that you use the Grand Canyon Dam twice. As a, as a negative dam 55, 60 years ago in the environment that was specific in our area? It's a good question. Yeah, so just who's making that assessment and what criteria? So, so to paraphrase, um, I talked about prioritizing rivers and prioritizing them, like what rivers are, what rivers um, we could, might be suitable or, or what water resources are suitable for impoundment or hydropower and what, what might not be and how to prioritize those. And, and this gentleman asked um, not only to explain that, but um, who was making those prioritizations? Well, I think the, the prioritization factor, you know, we can look at, um, you can think of a balance sheet between positive effects and negative effects uh, of a proposed dam. And, uh, you know, there are areas um, that our, our scientists, our ecologists, our fisheries biologists, and so forth, um, our climate scientists tell us that are probably not some place that we should dam. For instance, uh, say something like the Rio Baca that has a, a, just a, a gigantic um, ecosystem that it feeds, uh, an impoundment that it'll damage, or the Amazon, you know, the, the largest remaining rainforest on, on Earth. So I, I think it, there, there isn't kind of a single body that's, that's making those prioritizations. It's a number of people and locally based groups and scientists. But I think we can take a look and say, yeah, maybe there are some places that we should have hydropower, you know, on existing dams that don't have hydropower. I mean, we have, we have 70,000 large dams in this country already. Maybe some of those should be removed. Maybe some of those should have hydropower added to them. Um, we also have areas where water is flowing either through irrigation ditches, um, through other water resources that we could plumb for hydropower. Um, they're already impacted. They're existing infrastructure. They're, they're already something that humans have, have, uh, have managed and continue to manage. And that would be a great place for hydropower. Um, plopped up in the, the, the middle of the Skeena or, or one of the most last remaining, um, you know, biologically rich salmon runs, um, I, I don't think that's as good a, of an idea. I think not only from preserving those terrestrial areas or those areas inland, both for habitat, for wildness, and so forth, but we, we also support a gigantic salmon fishery um, that millions of people um, use as far as an econo economic benefit. So, I'm, I may not be being as as uh, as concrete as you, as you want, but I think it's I think it's a case by case basis, and I think you know multiple heads are better than one, and uh, you know you get a group of folks together um, in a region or a state or an area, and you should be able to prioritize um, which resources you should hang on to um, that deserve protection. Also, maybe resources that connect to existing resources. It's one of the things we're losing is connectivity, and uh, rivers are a great connective corridor. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Let's see if there's one. No? Okay. When you talk about damming the Amazon, uh, they're going to dam tributaries of the Amazon, I assume, not the huge thing itself. Well, I guess it depends on... Yeah, I mean, technically, it'll be, I, it's probably not going to be right down at the mouth. It'll be somewhere where there's more gradient um, and impoundment potential. But it, 
there are there are dams planned for the main stem of the Amazon. So. Yes. <coughs> no, I mean, I mean. <laughs> so the question was, when I say planned, do I mean finalized or do I mean planned? Um, that's a good question. You know. All of these dams and, and proposals are in various states of, of, of planning or leasing, um, but uh, they're, they're not finalized, I don't think, until they're built. Um, we have lots of cases in this country where uh, a number of projects have been stopped, whether they're dams or whether they're other, other detrimental environmental projects, up until the very last minute, like there are people out there building, and then they're stopped. So, so Nothing's, nothing's a done deal until it's built. And then maybe it's not a done deal um, later when it's removed and restored. So, thanks. Yes? Uh, in this shocking uh, story about British Columbia that you're telling us, is American Rivers the leader on fighting that, or are there some other groups? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, is American Rivers the lead on fighting the development in British Columbia that I talked about? And no, actually, we're a domestic organization. I should have mentioned that. This is, uh, these are things that um, I, I kind of feel like I can't talk about a global problem such as climate change without talking about global threats. So these are things our partners or our colleagues or, or sister organizations or however you want to call them are, are leading. Skeener Water, the Skeena Watershed Conservation Coalition would be one of them. Um, the uh, Uruk, you can look it up online. It's called the U Uruk River Post. Is uh, Mike Fay's website. That's uh, Uruk is U R U K or Uruk, Uruk. Maybe that's how you say it. But we, we we are not involved in that at all, other than you know maybe maybe moral support to colleagues or involved personally. But American Rivers works domestically. Great. Any other questions? Oh yeah, way in the back. Sorry, I didn't see you. Um, so with the Elwha River, I believe they're taking dams out on the planet, and there's some other um, stuff. So there seems to be a trend with dams. Um, do you think as climate change becomes more manifest, we might see that trend actually diminish or will it decrease? So I, di I didn't catch the last part. Sorry. As climate change becomes more manifest, do you think that trend will continue for for dam removal, or will it actually reverse? So, so the question was, uh, so with the dam removals that I talked about and then the dam removal that's planned on the series of dam removals on the Klamath, then there are a series planned on the Penobscot. Um, you know, Patagonia, the, the outdoor gear company and, and American Rivers just uh, announced that they're going to work together to remove 100 dams in 2012. Um, and so the gentleman in the back asked, uh, under climate change, do you think this, there seems to be a trend for dam removal? Do we feel like uh, this is going to continue? And yeah, no, I, I feel like there's yes on the sense that there is a lot of momentum um, for removing either old, degraded, damaged dams that aren't needed any longer or um, are environmentally detrimental. Um, I think we'll continue to see that and we'll continue, continue to see um, local watershed-based groups doing that work. Um, like I said, with 70,000 large dams though, that's, there, there's a lot of opportunity there for that to grow. Um, unfortunately, I think at the same time, the total balance of dams and calls for dams um, may actually increase. Um, a lot of folks look at dams um, as clean, carbon-free energy. And for those of us that know riparian ecology, river ecology, so forth, we know that it's not free energy. Um, we know that it has a lot of costs, both ecologically and economically, and socially as well. But um, the common perception out there is, uh, unfortunately, in the media and with other folks, is that, that that's not the case. And um, I think we'll see a lot more calls for that. Unfortunately, too, uh, you know, during the big dam buildup area in this country, Dams weren't always built because of need. In fact, often they, they weren't. They were, they were built for other reasons. They were built to curry political favor. They were built to, uh, to 
you know, try to instigate development in certain areas. They were built to try to create economies in places where there weren't some before. Um, the big dam build era has, for the most part, left us, but um, a lot of those companies and, and folks that, uh, you know, are, are replicating that model of, of economic growth, sometimes for very short-term gain internationally. Um, so I, I guess the, the question is two-part. Do I, I feel like there will be more momentum for removing dams, for sure, and restoring rivers, but I feel at the same time we're going to have calls for a lot of new dams in a lot of places that they weren't before. So. Some probably that shouldn't be built. Great, great questions. Any others? Yeah. You said uh, there's 70,000 dams in this country, and um, do you know the percentage of them that are already have hydropower, and what percentage could be could be retrofitted for hydropower? That's a really good question. So the question was, out of those large dams in this country. Do I know the percentage that either have hydropower already or could be retrofitted for hydropower? No, and, and you know what? It's funny that you mentioned that because when I said that earlier, I thought, gosh, I wish I had that statistic on me, but I don't. <laughs> so I won't try to wager a guess, but um, that'd be something to look up on Google after, after the presentation because that's a really good question. Yeah. As American rivers uh, invest at any time uh, getting the reconsideration of cheap water, especially in the West, to reflect its true fair market value? That's a good question. I don't, and unfortunately I'm going to have to say I don't know again. I don't know if there's anyone on American Rivers or at American Rivers working on that. But I think all of us in the water conservation community would like to see that happen, would like water to reflect its, its real value. And especially in, in areas that water is so heavily subsidized. Um, and especially in areas that's heavily subsidized for detrimental developments. Um, I think you bring up a great point. Um, and, uh, you know, some, the, the ecosystem services uh, movement that some folks are, I think, in the conservation community cautiously stepping into, um, which is basically looking at the, the ecosystem services that we get from our environment as, uh, as something that, um, is provided to us for free, basically, and trying to put value to that. Um, I, I, I think that will help with some of that valuation as well. But folks are, folks are hesitant for it and trying to do it right because, you know, if you start putting a price on the services that a river gives you and then uh, the economic conditions change, um, you might not be very happy with your original price that you put on it. So you've got to we've got to wade into that really carefully. It's a good point, though. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.